السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله my dear brothers and sisters and scholars and elders aunties and uncles may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa taala be upon every single one of you so I'm gonna take a different angle with regards to my story because I really believe that the art of sharing Islam is to give people what they need, not what they want. Okay? So I'm not going to deviate from my story much, but I'm going to use my story to give you some insights on how to deal with the challenges of today. And we have spiritual challenges and intellectual challenges. So my dear brothers and sisters, I was born in 1980, September the 21st. That makes me 42 years old, alhamdulillah. And I was born in the London borough of Hackney and I was born to Greek parents. My dad is from Athens and my mom is from Cyprus. She's a Greek Cypriot. She came to the UK as a refugee. She left her island Cyprus as a result of the Turkish Cypriot conflict. And my dad came to the UK in the 70s and he was actually homeless for around nine months. And to cut a long story short, I was born and I was brought up mostly for the first around 14 years of my life in Hackney in what would now be called a ghetto. It's gentrified now, it's a really nice place, but in the 80s and 90s I was brought up in a kind of low standard of living. It was, how can I describe it? It's a block of flats, it was built in a ditch. I was on the second floor, we were living on the second floor, and in line with the second floor was a train, a train track, and opposite the train track was a park. So we were literally in a ditch. So the second floor was in line with the ground level. And it was, alhamdulillah, a great experience, although it wasn't always easy. Like my dad tried to work and it was hard, sometimes he was unemployed. Many cases, you know, because of my dad's ethical worldview, he wouldn't like to cheat. He would try and be as straight and narrow as possible. And he would always, always say that in today's world, for you to be successful as a businessman, you have to step on people's back and things like that. And he would never do that. That wasn't his kind of character. He was very principled when it came to public things. And maybe as a result of being maybe overly principled, he sometimes wasn't that successful. He wasn't a shrewd businessman. So he had a business in the 80s called Miss Harris Fashions. And he used to do clothes for like big companies. But all of a sudden, it just collapsed. Because as you know, a lot of the clothing industry went into like Eastern Europe and other places. So he lost the business. And he was so concerned about people's well-being that he would borrow money just to give money to his staff because he didn't want to get rid of them because he felt, I have a family, I don't want my family to be hungry, so I need to you know, help others as well. So it was the case at times where maybe we wouldn't eat very nice food for around two weeks because my dad made those type of sacrifices. And that's the type of person that he was. I remember my father, he would work for like maybe three days in a row with hardly any sleep. And he would just basically drink coffee and have cigarettes, right? <laughs> and he was very, very hardworking. I don't think I've seen anyone as hardworking as my father. And there are probably people more hardworking. Well, in actual fact, I have seen someone more hardworking is the, our beloved Sheikh. But my dad was very, very hardworking. It was an inspiration. He had that kind of tenacity and sagacity and that kind of work ethic. And so my dad was a very principled person and he tried to learn different spiritual traditions. I remember, I think there were books on mystical uh, traditions, on Sikhism, he had stuff on Hinduism. He had the famous book called The Power of Positive Thinking. I still think I have the 1970s edition at home or in the office. And I was brought up in that type of environment. So my dad wasn't dogmatic, he wasn't religious, but he believed in the words of Jesus, you know, love, compassion, and so on and so forth. And he'd, he would use that as a basis for his man-made type of spirituality. And he was going on a journey. And I would see him develop himself and he was going on this existential journey, this spiritual journey. And there was different phases of his life where he would basically adapt and change. And I would be experiencing all of that. And that had a profound effect on me because it got me to think in similar ways. 
maybe via osmosis, social osmosis, maybe via directly consciously or even subconsciously, I had that type of internalization of asking those type of existential questions. What does it mean to exist? I remember when I was around 11 or 12 years old, around that age, I would sit in a bath and I would have this kind of existential crisis. It's a form of solipsism, which is you believe you're the only person that exists. But it wasn't just a philosophical thing. It was a lived experience. I actually felt extremely, extremely lonely to the point where I would cry. I would be in the bath. And by the way, I still love baths now. If I had a choice between spending time with brothers having a dinner or sitting in a hot bath for three hours, I would sit in a hot bath. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I'm an ambivert. So when I'm on stage, I'm quite, you know, maybe like, you know, masculine or whatever, loud. But usually sometimes I like to crawl in a home, uh, crawl in a hole or go and sit in a bath somewhere. Anyway, notwithstanding that, I would... <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what Shaq said. Well, he basically said, what if your wife is sitting in the bath? <laughs> Anyway, so I would sit in the bath as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, and I would be quite lonely because I realized that I was only consciously aware of my own conscious state. So I had the first-person experience of my own life, my own consciousness. But people that I loved and my friends who were not part of that immediate conscious experience, I felt if I can't experience their immediate conscious experience, then maybe... They're not real or they don't exist. I know that sounds really weird, but I can't even describe it because I don't think words would give it any justice. But I had this deep sense of loneliness. Yeah? And that lasted quite a while. And from what I remember, the only way I could reconcile it was belief in God. Because the belief in Allah, the belief in the creator of the heavens and the earth is the only possible explanation for the fact that I have inner subjective conscious states. There is something that it's like to be me in this moment. You don't know what it's like to be me in this moment. And even if you were to look into my mind and my brain and map out all the neurochemical pathways, you would still not know what it's like to be me in this moment. Because it's just a correlation. It's just neurochemical firings. You don't have my inner subjective conscious state. Even if we map your brain and you have a similar experience and it's the same neurochemical pathways, the neurochemical happenings, it doesn't mean we're having the same inner subjective conscious experience. Because the only way we'll know is by you describing it. I'm sad, I'm happy. But that doesn't mean we're having the same sadness and the same happiness. Why? Because words are vehicles to meaning and meaning is a representation of that inner subjective conscious experience. Anyway, this relates to the hard problem of consciousness in Western philosophy. So that was a kind of lonely period. Okay, lonely period. And I think that facilitated my yearning for things to be meaningful. Generally speaking, when I grew up a little bit more and I became a little bit more mature, I would want things to be meaningful. If things were like reduced to the ego or shallow or just, you know, fun, if you like, I would like it, of course, because I was young and I wanted to play sports and hang around with my friends. But generally speaking, as I matured, I wanted things to be a little bit more meaningful. They had to be grounding in something that was other than just myself. So I think that was a blessing from Allah because it helped me question and it helped me look into man, life and the universe. The big questions about why do I exist? What's going to happen after I die? And there were three main things that I was really attracted to when I was growing up with regards to Muslims and Islam. Three main things. Number one, Islam made sense, right? Islam made a hell of a lot of sense. There is one creator that you worship, that the Quran is from Allah, and there were so many good reasons that I read, and I was like, if this is true, this makes sense. And for me, Islam had an intellectual foundation. It satisfied the mind and it gave sakina to the heart to a certain degree, especially at that stage of my life. And then what I saw, because I had many Muslim friends, I really appreciate some Islamic values. It was a fitri thing, because my dad, really his values were aligned with many things that Islam says. May Allah guide him. <clears throat> so, um, I was, <laughs> so sorry. I was attracted to the Islamic values, like brotherhood 
and the haya of the sisters and all of these things, even growing up as a teenager and like the honor for the women. And from a secular liberal perspective, I was really aligned to that. I felt that was really attractive. It had some depth in it, right? Some meaning. And those type of values were really attractive, attractive, attractive to me. The other thing that I highlighted from the values was also brotherhood. I really appreciated how the Muslims would connect with each other because in Hackney, where I was from, there were people from different backgrounds. You had Egyptians, you had Pakistanis, you had Indians, you had Bengalis, you had Africans, you had Turks, you had Kurds. Wallahi, the best experience because you get to connect with so many different people. But there was a common thread that tied together all of these brothers and sisters and it was the Deen. And for me, that was extremely attractive to the point where I would get upset. I would know that I was close to them because I had a similar cultural, uh, you know, uh, affinity to them, right? But they still sidelined me a little bit because I'm not a brother, right? And I would expose them. How dare you? I'm close to you. I'm one of your guys. And I wouldn't really understand why I was alien to them to a certain degree. Although they made me feel welcome. You know, they would take a thousand bullets for me. We were close. But there was just something that I knew I just wasn't part of it. And I wanted to be part of it because it, this is love. Who doesn't want to be part of that type of love? That love that transcends ethnicity. That love that transcends ego. That love that transcends any ephemeral thing, empty thing. It's like there was this a transcendent type of love because they knew this was from Allah. Allah is al-wudud. He is the loving wood coming from the loving that is giving. And they had that expression of love, that giving love to each other. Even if they weren't very practicing, it was there. And that's part of the kind of spiritual, cultural, uh, you know, environment of the Muslim community, even as a minority. And that was like, I need to taste some of this. This is amazing, right? I need to experience it. And I, I think that was, that, that's exactly what my soul was, was trying to tell me. So those were the three main things. Islam was, had an intellectual foundation the Islamic values and brotherhood. And brothers and sisters, we need to be aware that there are people in this country and outside of this country specifically that want to destroy that. They want you to think that Islam doesn't have an intellectual foundation. They want you to think that Islamic values are backward. They want you to think that this brotherhood is too communitarian. They want to atomize you and individualize you. And this is something I want to focus on right now. From this story, you need to learn that our values are superior. You need to learn that our brotherhood transcends all types of brotherhood. And you need to learn that Islam is haq. And when you're going to university, or when you're engaging at different levels in this society, there are going to be people who want to dismantle that because they are frankly shayateen. They want to dismantle that because they think they have a universal truth. They think they have an absolute truth. But if you scratch the surface and you don't have an inferiority complex, you don't have a Gora complex, you realize what Islam is, then you're going to do anything possible to try and prevent that from infecting the youth and infecting your hearts and minds. For example, I was at LUMS, Lahore University of Management Sciences, the Oxford of Pakistan, where the future leaders are going to come from. They are infecting the youth with freedom. Oh, people of Pakistan, you are subjugated with your backward religion. You have to be free. Freedom. And I told the youth, use your mind, have critical thinking. Don't think this is absolute and universal. Learn to understand the philosophical assumptions or the premises because every thought, every idea, every truth has assumptions. Some assumptions are grounded in reason. Some assumptions are irrational. Some assumptions are incoherent. Other assumptions are coherent. Islam's premises, principles, assumptions are coherent and rational. Liberalism, secularism, and all the other isms which we discussed today is a new term. All the other bakwas isms, right? Nonsense. All of these do not have a strong foundation and you need to unravel them. So when they sell you, sell you this PR campaign of freedom, what do they really mean? They mean their conception of freedom. Because if you study freedom, even in an academic setting, you know freedom is the absence of coercion. And when you study coercion, coercion is not just being forced to do something. Because there are many scenarios you're forced to do something, but it doesn't necessarily follow that you're unfree, that your freedom has been curtailed. 
So many scenarios. For example, if you have to sign life-saving, you know, you have to sign a consent form for life-saving surgery, the, the other option is untenable. You're going to die. So you're forced, you're coerced to sign the consent form. And there are many other examples. To cut a long philosophical story short, coercion is when your rights are violated. So if freedom is the absence of coercion, and coercion is when your rights are violated, then freedom is when you have your rights fulfilled. And being unfree is when you have your rights violated. So we should say to them, what conception of rights? And who has the right to give you your rights? Your ego, your nafs, or Allah? Answer the question. Allah. And also, what conception of rights? They have ikhtilaf amongst themselves. The positive view of rights, the negative view of rights. We would say it's the Islamic view of rights because it came from Al-Haq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this clear? So you, already you're empowered just in a very basic way how to dismantle this so-called idea of freedom. It's being sold to you from a liberal perspective. It's been sold to you from a perspective as if it's absolute and it's universal. No, it's not. It's all about rights. And we would say the rights from the Sharia, the rights from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the rights that we need to fulfill. And they're good for the whole of humanity. Because who is Allah? Allah is Ar-Rahman, He's the intensely merciful. Allah is Al-Wudud, He is the loving, the most loving. Allah is Al-Hakim, the wise, Al-Alim, the, wa the, 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 the knowing. Allah has the picture, we just have the pixel. And His commands are in line with His nature, His names and attributes. So when He commands something, it is good for us. It's based on a divine wisdom, it's based on a Rahmah. Not only is that the case, but we, if we have sound reasoning, we can also rationalize why they're good for us too. So don't let them sell to you a liberalized sense of conception of freedom. Because it hasn't served them well, brothers and sisters. Islam has served us well. Is this clear? The second point with regards to values. At the universities, they're trying to sell you this LGBTQ plus narrative. And we need to be clear about this. We need to be clear about what Allah says and how we should respond to this. They say, what's wrong with same-sex intercourse in public? It doesn't harm anybody. Why would you disagree with this? You're a bigot. You're backward. Something is wrong with you. Brothers and sisters, reclaim the narrative. Reclaim the rainbow. Don't let them say this to you. Don't get me wrong. Foundationally, we give everyone dignity and rights and compassion and we're nice to people. Okay? This is very important. Because even the Prophet wasallam, when he dealt with the mushrikeen on an individual basis, there was that sense of commitment to the goodness and guidance. We remember in the Battle of Uhud, where the Prophet wasallam, was injured. Sahaba were killed. It was like a, a loss. And then they said, curse the mushrikeen. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was not here to curse or condemn. I was sent here as a mercy. Even in that context. However though, we need to give them our frame of reference, our worldview. And when it comes to this issue, there are two false assumptions that we have to understand when they're pushing this down our throats. In Lums, I was at Lums and there was a whole week full of activities concerning this narrative concerning this LGBTQ plus narrative. And we have to say we are Muslims and we have the truth and we have a tradition. Don't assume this is universal and absolute. It is not, brothers and sisters. It's based on two assumptions. Assumption number one, that they think they own themselves. Who owns us, brothers and sisters? So this is the rububi of Allah. This is the creative agency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He owns us. If Allah owns us, then he has the right to tell us what to do with our bodies. Yes or no? Good. Second assumption, they have a particular view on individual rights. We believe individual rights within the Islamic framework, the hukuk al-ibad, the rights of the servants. But we have a divine command conception. They have an individualistic conception and it's connected to a normative ethical theory called utilitarianism. The maximum number of happiness 
the maximum level of happiness for the maximum number of people within a secular framework. We say we disagree with this. Yes, we believe in maslaha, mafsada, we believe in benefit and harms, but within the divine command framework, what Allah commands. And we would say to them, our reference is Allah's commands, not your limited notions of what is well-being for a community. And they have a secular assumption because the maslaha for them, the benefit for them, ends in the grave. We believe in the akhirah. The sharia is good for the dunya and the akhirah. Not just for the akhirah, not just for the dunya. So when we even assess the benefits, it's based on akhirah as well. So we would say to them, why do we have to adopt your normative ethical theory? We are no obligation to adopt your normative ethical theory. So if we know Allah owns us, and if we know the correct way of being, our moral behavior, what is right and wrong, is obeying the commands of Allah, then you know why this is wrong. And you need to tell them you have two false assumptions. Do not assume this is universal. Do not assume this is absolute. Now they may say, but I don't believe in Allah. I don't believe in divine commands. This is exactly where we want them, brothers and sisters. So we start discussing Tawheed. We start discussing the foundations of Islam. That Allah is a reality. He's worthy of worship. The Prophet ﷺ is a prophet. The Quran is from Allah. We formulate that foundation for them that is true. And whatever comes from truth is true. Is this clear? We need to change the narrative. Is this clear, brothers and sisters? So when it comes to values, the values of Islam are superior. Another thing I would like to add before we end. Another thing that's happening in our communities and our universities, brothers and sisters, is this idea of liberalism. Liberalism, it's everywhere. It's in the media, it's at the universities, it's in the academy, it's permeating nearly every space. And it's, and it's, and it's arrived in Pakistan. We need to realize again, liberalism is not absolute and it's not a universal truth. What is the foundation of liberalism? It's the primacy of the self. The primacy of the individual. Many comment and they say this is about individualism and atomism. Meaning that the individual is an abstract entity devoid from social obligations and attachments. We do not have this view of the individual. We have a complementarian, communitarian perspective that the individual has this relationship with the society and society impacts and has a relationship with the individual. You could infer this from the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu concerning the limits of Allah. Where there are, two, there are people on a boat, an upper deck and a lower deck. The upper deck is giving fresh water to the lower deck, but they stop giving fresh water, then the lower deck end up making a hole in the bottom of the boat. What happens to the boat? It sinks, society sinks. And we have seen this increasing atomization and individualism being propagated in these societies. And it's a huge danger, brothers and sisters, because if you start to atomize a society and you move away from what Allah wants for society, then you see things from an individualistic perspective, what's in it for me. And then if this carries on in the next 10, 20 years, your future children are going to send you to glorified concentration camps which are called old people's homes. Is that what you want for your mother and your father? To send them to glorified concentration camps? This happens because they have a particular worldview, they have a particular aqidah. And we need to understand this before it's too late. Because sometimes we have this inferiority complex, sometimes we don't know how to navigate the space, how to challenge, we feel overwhelmed, but you need to take a step back. Seek the specialists, engage with each other, empower each other, and understand how to respond to these problems. Because these are three of the most critical problems that are occurring in Pakistan from an intellectual point of view. Liberalism, the LGBTQ plus narrative, and this whole idea of freedom which is also connected to liberalism. Once you're able to respond to it in an Islamic way and show how Islam is superior, it's based on the truth, it's good for all societies, it is a mercy and justice for all people, and you could show this to the world and show this to the ummah here, then things are going to change. And the reason I've mentioned this in this discussion is just to plant the seed in your heart and mind so you can continue that journey. So you see things from a different perspective. You see applied aqidah. Because what we've just done is applied aqidah. So when you know Allah is the Rabb, the Tawheed of Rububiyah, he, is the, he has creative agency, then you know 
He owns us. If He owns us and we can't do what we want with our bodies, Allah has a right to tell us. Such a simple point, but it affects nearly everything concerning morality, your worldview, and how you should respond to these challenges of today. Is this clear? So, brothers and sisters, you know, I want this to motivate you so you could engage on a university level because now is the time to act. Now is the time to act, brothers and sisters. We have no choice. We're in a junction point in history. We're at the crossroads of history. And if you look at the trends, if we now arise and warn and come together, not have petty squabbles amongst each other, but think of a bigger vision and unite to showcase the profound, timeless, superior Islamic values and the Islamic worldview and show them at the same time it's good for them, then we'll be able to preserve our intellectual spiritual identity. Is this clear? So how do we do this? Well, let's give, let me give you a, a very basic foundation so you can continue that journey. Allah says in chapter 16, verse 1 to 5, call to the way of your Lord, the sabil of Allah, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With hikmah, with wisdom, and with good preaching, with hasana, good preaching. And discuss with them in ways that are best. The ulama discuss this verse and they conclude that the primary way of engaging with people is with hikmah and goodness. Hikmah includes ilm because hikmah is applied ilm. Applying your knowledge in the right way at the right time. And this is why you have to have ilm to apply your hikmah. And to apply hikmah, you have to make it relevant. You have to know the context. So that means use your mind. Hasana, goodness, includes ihsan, includes rahmah, includes being genuinely committed to people's goodness and guidance. Is this clear? And this echoes Surah Furqan, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam to speak softly to Fir'aun, layyinan. That's the default position. Now Imam Al-Qurtubi, he comments on this and he basically says that if, Fira, if Musa alayhi salam, alayhi salam had to speak kindly to Fir'aun, then imagine how we should speak to everybody else. Don't get me wrong, it's not always nice. Sometimes when the context change, then you have to be more assertive. But then you have to assess it with the maslaha and masada, the harm, the benefits, seek the scholar's guidance. But the default position, hikmah, and goodness. Is this clear? And Allah says, where, uh, when you debate with them, debate with them in ways that are best. This is very interesting. Three main scholars from different theological backgrounds. Ibn Kathir, Imam al-Nasafi, and also Jamakshari, the grammarian. They comment on this aspect of the verse. And they said, when you discuss and debate, you do it with gentleness, not with harshness. You do it with kindness. You do it to awaken their hearts. You seek the objective which is to awaken something within them. So that's how you should discuss and engage with people. Now obviously that can change based on the context. But this is a kind of first principle that we have to internalize when we're engaging with others. Is this clear? Is this clear? Good. So the final thing I wanted to mention was, this, I've got two minutes left, which was the spiritual struggle. So when I became Muslim in October the 5th, 2002, Alhamdulillah, I think it was a Saturday, I started to engage in da'wah. Now, many of you are going to start engaging in da'wah, you're in activism, you're, in, you're doing political work, social work, humanitarian work, academic work, whatever type of work you're doing, you need to remember you need to do this for the sake of Allah. Anything that I've learned in my journey so far is that you have to focus on ikhlas. It's an ongoing struggle but you need to focus. Many of you are young in this room and you're going to have a vision for yourself to make an impact for, uh, for this country, for Pakistan. Which if you make an impact for Pakistan, you're going to make an impact for the Ummah. Because I really believe and I echo Sheikh Haytham's view that Pakistan has the potential to lead the Ummah. But in order for you to gain that reward, you have to do it for the sake of Allah. And doing things for the sake of Allah means that you're doing it because He is worthy of the act. Because you love Allah, because you want His divine reward, and you want to prevent yourself from being inflicted with divine punishment. And there are many things that you need to remind yourself on a daily basis to ensure you have ikhlas. And the reason ikhlas is important, because your actions are not accepted unless you do it for the sake of Allah, you have the right intention, and it's in line with the sunnah of the Prophet 
So one key point in developing a class is every day do a deed that only you and Allah knows. Outside of the fara'id. Do a deed every day that only you and Allah knows. Another thing to understand is understand the consequences of not having a class, which could be the hellfire. Understand the consequences of having a class, which could be Jannah, eternal bliss. Read stories of people that had ikhlas, stories of the pious predecessors. Also work on your spiritual heart because ikhlas is not in the liver, it's in the qalb. And the qalb has fitan, shubahat and shahawat. The qalb has diseases like kibr and arrogance and hasad, blameworthy jealousy and ujub, vanity and riya, ostentation. To strengthen the spiritual heart, you have to engage in your athkar in the morning and the evening. You have to engage in dua. Try and do tahajjud, do tadabbur of the Qur'an, recite the Qur'an, be around good people because you're the product of the five people around you. You have to put these things in place in order for you to be eligible for this divine bliss. And isn't that what it's all about really at the end of the day? So please focus on this because sometimes we get lost in the activism, we get lost in the dawah, we get lost in the glory of being here. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, us being in this room, me being on this platform, is a compounded, undeserved gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll end on this. In chapter 59, Allah talks to the Arabs. You know the Arabs, some of them thought that faith, iman, Islam was a gift, to the, was a favor to the Prophet And Allah says, no, say, this Islam is a gift to you. So if iman is a gift, what about calling other people to iman? It's an undeserved gift. So let's respond with gratitude, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless every single one of you. Hopefully I've given you, I've agitated you enough so you could continue this journey and start exploring some of these ideas. Focus on ikhlas and understand that Islam is true and whatever comes from truth is true. We have a timeless tradition, a truth that people need to hear about. And don't get infected with these ideologies of freedom and liberalism and all of this stuff because they have false assumptions and hopefully I've given you an idea on how to unpack them and how to respond to them effectively. And remember, do with hikmah and do it with rahmah, do it with mercy. Jazakallah for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.